Playing Shakespeare, not reading him or writing about him, but playing him. Over a thousand books or articles are written about him every year. In 1980, there were 195 books and 877 articles, mostly in Japanese. And yet very little is put on paper about how to act him. Well, I think I can guess why. I was once urged to write about him, but I just couldn't do it. I thought that the sort of points that need to be made could only arise truly in the context of working with actors. Each actor and his experience is worth many books. What I have to say is in the end worth nothing if it doesn't come alive in the performance of living and breathing actors. The best guide, I think, to playing him for the actors comes from Shakespeare himself, who was an actor. And it's in Hamlet's advice to the players, and it can't be quoted too often. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of our players do, I had as lief the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand thus, but use all gently. For in the very torrent, tempest, and as I may say, whirlwind of your passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Be not too tame, neither. But let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance, that you o'erstep not the modesty of nature. For anything so or done is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold, as twere, the mirror up to nature. I believe that one speech goes to the heart of it. It's one of those utterances which seem a bit simple and limited at first, but if you live with it, it begins to resonate and open doors. I believe that in the Elizabethan theatre, the actors knew how to use and interpret the hidden direction Shakespeare himself provides in his verse and his prose. I therefore believe that the kind of points we shall be making work best in the theatre not by a director telling an actor about them, but by an actor learning them largely by experience and applying them for himself. There are few absolute rules about playing Shakespeare, but many possibilities. So we don't offer ourselves as high priests but as explorers or detectives, we want to test and to question, and particularly to show how Shakespeare's own text can help to solve the seeming problems in that text. Of course, much of it is instinct and guesswork. We will try to distinguish between what is clearly and objectively so and what is highly subjective. I hope that if I'm too dogmatic, the actors will challenge me. I should also make it clear what I'm not talking about. I shall hardly talk at all about directing him, and at first I shall try to keep clear of interpretation. We shan't talk at first about individual characters or plays as a whole. We shall concentrate on finding out how Shakespeare's text works. Of course, what we say is bound to be personal. We don't believe there's only one way of doing Shakespeare, that way madness lies. Out of the infinite number of questions which come up when we work on him, we have picked the ones that seem to us the most important. Another actor or another director would rightly stress things differently or violently disagree with us or raise points which we leave out because he felt they were more important. We shall look at lots of short individual passages 
often cut down from many different plays. But I believe they can all make sense out of context and that any of you who don't know the play in question will still be able to follow quite easily the points we're making. So, on your imaginary forces, work. You, the audience, are quite as important in all this as our actors, both now and in the theatre. If we don't reach you, we fail. We must make you listen and share and follow the story. But above all, listen. It's so easy for an audience not to listen, particularly with a knotty and difficult text. I may be cynical, but I don't believe most people really listen to Shakespeare in the theatre unless the actors make them do so. I certainly don't. I know that it's only too easy for me to get the general gist and feeling of a speech, but just because I get the gist, I often don't listen to the lines in detail. Not unless the actors make me. So stick with us, and we'll try to show you how that can happen. But you may say, all oh, that's very fine, but what's so difficult about acting Shakespeare? What's the problem? Or indeed, is there a problem? Well, yes, I believe that there is. Two things need to come together, and they won't do so without a lot of hard work and much trial and error. There's Shakespeare's text, written at a particular time and for particular actors. Cut me to pieces, Volsies, men and lads. Stain all your edges on me, boy, false hound. If you have writ your annals true, tis there that like an eagle in a dovecot, I fluttered your Volsians in Corioli. Alone I did it, boy. Secondly, there are the actors today with their modern habit of mind and their different acting tradition based on the kind of text that they're more used to. It's great here. What? Why did you pick me up like that? Why? Yeah. Sorry, then. Tell us. How many girls you had? Oh, no, I told you my life. Here, hold on. What? You got a spot. Where? Here, hold still. Is it big? Hold still! Let go, you see. Ah! Oh, got it. Oh, well. <laughs> well, there we are. We have the two chief ingredients with which to start rehearsals. Shakespeare's text and a group of modern actors. So how do the two come together? Let's start with the second as the more accessible. <clears throat> Our tradition is based more than we're usually conscious of on various modern influences like Freud and television and the cinema and the teachings of the director and actor Stanislavski. And I suspect that he works on us all the time, often without us really knowing it. So now, all of you say, what, what are to you the most important questions as you begin work on a modern text? No, any text. What's the most important thing that you go for? Well, I'll start off with, as Stanislavski says, if you speak any lines or do anything mechanically without fully realizing who you are, where you come from, why, what you want, where you are going, and what you will do when you get there, you will be acting without imagination. Or, to put it in our own words, what is our motivation, our objective, or our aim, or our intention? We use lots of words for the same thing. Stanislavski again. On the stage, there cannot be, under any circumstances, action which is directed immediately at the arousing of a feeling for its own sake. Or, in other words, we must beware of playing the quality or the, the general emotional tone of a speech. In other words, if, if it's a sad speech, you mustn't just sound sad. You must find everything, every thought. You must make it specific and fresh. Meaning we must dig into a character um, socially and psychologically. Yes, socially, um, which means being concerned with other people. 
our audience, other characters on the stage, impersonated by the other actors. So it's not enough to be aware of our own thoughts, our own feelings, our own words. We must listen to the words, understand the feelings and the thoughts of the other characters. On the other hand, we do all know the, the sort of actor who won't speak at all until he feels absolutely the inner need to do so. Huge long pauses, and by the time he's ready, he's brilliant, but the, the audience is fast asleep. <laughs> so perhaps it's good also to remember the, the John Gilgood story of uh, when he was asked, now, uh, Sir John, what exactly is your intention at this point? Um, to which he replied, get on to the stage, dear boy. <laughs> good. Listen for a moment to an over-serious theatrical practitioner who, in his way, is also talking about intentions. I should like to cite examples of game beats in the opening scene of King Lear. <laughs> now, the game Lear wishes to play with his daughters, which might be called benevolent father and loving children, leads us to a model of the translations needed to play it successfully. Now, the child in Lear is cathected which may be a symptom of old age, which we call second childishness. Well, hence Lear's opening kick comes in the form of benevolent parent, and his social action is to divide his kingdom. However, his object is ulterior and comes from his cathected child. <laughs> Beware of jargon. It can lead to talking about it, replacing actually doing it. So all of you challenge me if I fall into the same <laughs> trap. Though we're exploring something complex, we all of us have got all the time to try to be simple. Well, I hope we're reasonably clear about what our modern tradition is. But actually, it's a great deal more modern than we know. The key technical terms we're using were not known to the Elizabethan actors. They've only come into existence during the last hundred years or so. Characterization, in our theatrical sense, is a mid-19th century word, though character in the sense of a part assumed by an actor, comes in a hundred years earlier. Motivation seems to be a 20th century term, and in its theatrical sense, it hasn't yet got into the Oxford Dictionary. And naturalistic is the same. Now, this is rather salutary. I'm not decrying our modern tradition, merely trying to put it in perspective. It suggests how surprising our acting style would have seemed to the Elizabethans. I don't know that I agree no. with John there. Uh, I suspect uh, actors throughout the generations have tried to be real in their own terms. After all, Hamlet's advice to the players seems to be good advice that a modern director might give to modern actors about not being too theatrical, not sawing the air too much, but thinking about the reality of the situation. Uh, what is, however, modern about our approach is the jargon that we use. As you've just pointed out, motivation was not a term that Shakespeare would have understood. But the feeling behind what motivation means, I suspect Shakespeare and his actors would have understood. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that, I'm sure that probably is true. That, I mean, that their ability, uh, their, their instinctive apprehension of situations was so, I mean, I think probably so much closer to them without um, uh, some of the distractions that we have in our day and times. I mean, very much they depended on the spoken word, the use of the word, the word as food, which they, I think probably use much more sensibly in the sense of almost eating words, therefore passing them and through that building up an extraordinary complexity, which I think Shakespeare then bothered to examine in greater psychological depth. Mm. John, what exactly do you mean when John. you say naturalistic? Because that can mean different things to different people, can't it? Yes, I think I must define that. That's very good. I mean the acting style and the kind of text which is the norm in the theatre and film and television today, i.e. the deliberate attempt to make everything as natural and lifelike as possible. So let's look at an example. Give us uh, the opening line of The Merchant of Venice. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. Now, that simple line can be said in an infinite number of ways. On the one hand, you could go for the mood and the quality of it. Try it sadly. Uh, do you mean by the mood or the quality of just painting it over with uh, a colour called sadness? Yes, the, the feeling. <laughs> like, uh, in sooth, I know not why I am so sad. Well, now try it humorously. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. <laughs> now, now try and ask what is Antonio's intention. Perhaps it's to 
try to explain himself. So rather than painting the line, uh, think about it and let the voice just do what it will. Search the thought. Make a connection between the mouth and the brain, and yeah. maybe the heart. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. Yes, or try to do it as avoiding explaining yourself. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. Or try to make light of your sadness. <laughs> It'll come out rather than as the last <laughs> one. the same one, you can see it coming. <laughs> In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. And one more, try and put an end to the conversation. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. <laughs> so on. God, it's over. <laughs> I don't think there's much doubt, is there, that the second way, going for the intention, is more interesting and alive and human. We learn much more about the speaker and his situation. Well, of course, it's impossible to decide uh, exactly how one would want to say that line without considering many other things which are not directly related uh, to uh, what noise the tongue is making on the roof of the mouth, like, uh, who am I saying the line to? Uh, how long have I known him? Where have we just been? Um, what were the other words spoken before this first line of the play? Were there any words before the play began? Uh, what are likely to be the words spoken in later scenes, and, and so on? It's a whole complex uh, of which the sound is just... Uh, the outward expression. That's right. So, in other words, rehearsal of a scene is going to be about character and about relationships and situation and certainly about social background. And today the director helps to sift those possibilities. At some point in rehearsals, agreement is reached. And in this case, Antonio, probably quite late because the possibilities are so many. Shakespeare never actually tells us for certain why Antonio is so sad. Now, these simple examples take us, I think, to the heart of our modern acting tradition. Relationships, character, intentions. So don't let's lose touch with that, because we'll keep coming back to it. But what about the Elizabethan theatre? We don't know all that much about how they rehearsed, but we do know that direction in the sense of detailed analysis of a scene or play probably didn't exist. And uh, as far as we can tell, they had no director in our sense, but the author often instructed the actors. Well, in fact, that's exactly what, ha what Hamlet was doing in the um, speak the speech passage that we read earlier, because he actually wrote the speech that the players are going to insert into their performance. He thinks he's got the right to direct it as well. The Elizabethan actors had very little rehearsal, virtually none in our terms. Yes, the diary of Elizabethan theatre manager shows us that they might have as many as 40 plays in their repertory in a year, and that they put on a play in a few days. And indeed, the outdoor theatre, with its particular demands, its distractions, um, forced perhaps on the actors a cruder style than what we aim for. And there was certainly a traditional style of acting which was formal and, and bombastic, which Shakespeare tried to get away from. What we do know that they didn't have is um, the luxury of time that we have at the moment. Uh, I mean, we, we now approach characters rather as a, a psychiatrist would, would approach a patient. We sort of sniff around him very often. We, we don't even stand up with the texts till three weeks into rehearsal. We often take ten weeks to rehearse a Shakespeare play, and as John Stewart said, they, they often had only a few days. And actors didn't, didn't, in fact, have the whole text to study. I mean, even leading actors, you know, had their parts written out separately with nothing, nothing but their own cues added. In fact, I can remember when I first started in rep, yeah, one used to get just what things called cue scripts, which were um, only your part with the cue immediately before it, just the last sentence. So you could tell whether, you're, whether you had a big part or a small part that <laughs> fortnight, because it would either be this thin or that. But, I mean, no sense of the whole play. And yet Shakespeare wrote for the Elizabethan theatre. And he wrote these infinitely rich and complex plays with great psychological depths. I don't think he'd have done it if his actors couldn't have done him justice. And I believe that he both accepted his own theatre and his own tradition, and yet himself transformed it. In a sense, I think that Shakespeare is the inventor both of characterization in depth and of naturalistic speech. There's not much of it in the theatre before him. 
Let's look at the fashion that he inherited. First, let's hear a conqueror boasting. Alan, read a bit of Tamburlaine the Great. I will, with engines never exercised, conquer, sack, and utterly consume your cities and your golden palaces. And with the flames that beat against the clouds, incense the heavens and make the stars to melt. And till by vision or by speech I hear immortal Jove say, cease my Tamburlaine, I will persist a terror to the world, making the meteors, <coughs> that's what it does to your voice, you see. <laughs> making the meteors that like armed men, <coughs> Murder, Marlow. I'll carry on. <laughs> Making the meteors that, like armed men, are seen to march upon the towers of heaven, run tilting round about the firmament, and break their burning lances in the air for honour of my wondrous victories. <laughs> Very Marlowian. Here is high language, but there isn't much character or complexity. Now let's listen to a father finding his son murdered. Then do a bit of uh, the Spanish tragedy. What outcries pluck me from my naked bed and chills my throbbing heart with trembling fear? Who calls Hieronimo? Speak, here I am. I did not slumber, therefore it was no dream. But stay, what murderous spectacle is this? A man hanged up and all the murderers gone and in my bower to lay the guilt on me. This place was made for pleasure, not for death. Those garments that he wears, I oft have seen. Alas, it is Horatio, my sweet son. Oh, no, but he that Willem was my son. Oh, was it thou that calls me from my bed? Oh, speak, if any spark of life remain. I am thy father. Who has slain my son? There's an emotional situation, and yet very flat language. But what Ben did was to fill it out and give it life, because he lived through the story, and he had to bring life to something that was pared down to the bare bones in actual text. Now let's look at a third example of literary Elizabethan prose. The rose, although a little it be eaten with the canker, yet being distilled yieldeth sweet water. The iron, though fretted with the rust, yet being burnt in the fire shineth brighter. And wit, although it hath been eaten with the canker of his own conceit and fretted with the rust of vain love, yet being purified in the still of wisdom and tried in the fire of zeal, will shine bright and smell sweet in the nostrils of all young novices. As you can see, character here is two-dimensional and the rich language, when it's rich, can get monotonous. And these are examples from famous texts. Yet in Shakespeare, our traditions, both the modern and the Elizabethan, come together. I believe our tradition actually derives from him. In a sense, Shakespeare himself invented it, though he didn't, of course, know that he did so at the time. That's why I believe that the problem that I've been enunciating of how to marry the two of traditions, in fact, doesn't exist once you get to know how Shakespeare's text works. If the actor gets in tune with it, you'll find many naturalistic clues and hints about character so that it does, in fact, combine the two traditions most of the time. But it may not always seem so to an actor who's new to Shakespeare. Sheila, you've only plunged into Shakespeare quite recently. Mm. Tell us your feelings of coming to terms with it. Yes, well, coming to it at my great old age, I, I must say I, I wondered whether I was going to have to alter my whole approach to my work. And indeed, during the rehearsal process, and in a situation like this, I feel tremendously inhibited. Mm. But I found, miraculously, when I got on the stage and in front of an audience having to communicate, it was quite extraordinary. I found that if I let it flow, just happen, 
It seemed the most natural thing in the world. And what's more, the, the language is so potent that I felt I had to make less effort than I've ever had to make in the whole of my career. And certainly, I had to embellish less, like I'm doing now. <laughs> because Shakespeare gave it more. Shakespeare yes. did it for you. Yes, I mean, I find sometimes that it seems better just to stand and say it. Now, whether I'd absorbed a lot in the rehearsal process, I mean, possibly I had. But I don't know. How do the other more experienced Well, I think that is feel? the main thing, isn't it? It's, it's trusting the language. I mean, I, th I think every actor who approaches um, a, a Shakespeare text comes to a point, especially in emotional scenes, where they think, Do you know, I know exactly how this character feels. I know the depth of his passion. I know about wh what the brain is doing. Why have I got these flipping words in the way? Then it's not the way I would say it. And the, the leap we have to get over is that one, so that we have to come to terms with the fact that the evidence for a, um, who a character is is not just what he says, but how he says it. Yes, we've got to find how the, and why the character needs those words. Right. Um, I remember once with you, um, early on when I was just studying, that this need to find, to f you've got to find that language, that rich language, and therefore you said, it's a very interesting thing, you said the emotion has got to be bigger in order to actually create those words. And that was a, a terrific note, because the moment you actually felt something realer and bigger, then, then you had to say those words, then they fitted into what you were feeling. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can take comfort from the fact that people who come to a theatre are, are called an audience, audio, here. Uh, people who watch television are viewers uh, mm -hmm. and look rather than listen, though I hope today that you're listening as well. Uh, and we're helped today because um, the tendency is for us to want to work in smaller theatres where there isn't, um, uh, it isn't always easy to have, fortunately, the distractions of the big spectacle uh, and not much scenery. And therefore, the, the audience are close enough to pick up every detail of the voices, inflections. Uh, yeah. It wasn't as easy for the 19th century actors who were working in large theatres or in America today where. Uh, um, uh, it is, uh, Shakespeare in acting is different from ours, I think, mainly because their theatres are much larger, uh, and therefore it leads to a grander, uh, more generalised, open style of acting than perhaps we favour at the moment in England. I think there's an actual difference in the senses. I think that the Elizabethans probably had a much sharper sense of smell than us because of the foulness of the stench in the streets. And also, I'm sure they had a much sharper ear than we have, and that they picked up words in a way that we don't. We're, we're more trained to go by the eye, aren't we, from television and from films, but I bet their ear was sharper. Uh, uh, and equally, we, we're, words for us are not only uh, spoken, but they are written. Uh, we're most of us That's literate, right. but the Elizabethans were not yeah. literate, yeah. and words for them were, were sounds. And their language was growing too, wasn't it? I mean, it was actually a living, really a living thing, much more than our languages. That's right. Let's look now at a bit of text in more detail. Let's go back to the opening of The Merchant of Venice, where Antonio the Merchant is talking to his friends Solerio and Solania. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. It wearies me. You say it wearies you. But how I caught it, found it, or came by it, what stuff it is made of, whereof it is born, I am to learn. And such a scant wit. And such a want wit. Yes. <laughs> and such a want wit sadness makes of me that I have much ado to know myself. Your mind is tossing on the ocean. There where your Argus is with portly sail, like signors and rich burghers on the flood, or as it were, the pageants of the sea, to overpeer the petty traffickers, the curtsy to them, do them reverence, as they fly by them with their woven wings. Good. Now, let's compare the two speeches. Now, Antonio is, is relatively naturalistic, isn't it? Or isn't it? Um, yes, it's quite easy, if, I think, for a modern actor to get into it because there aren't many old-fashioned words in it, though I do note that it's written in verse yeah. and uh, not prose. 
And I've just occurred to me that I probably did that speech absolutely wrong. I'm far too slow and ruminative because Solaria says your mind is tossing on the ocean and it sounds as if perhaps my mind should have been more tossing. And... But anyway, that's just no, that's a, a point a, of interpretation. That's a good thought. But what I want to do is to compare the two. When I say yours is naturalistic, what I mean is it's naturalistic in comparison yeah. with Solaria. Mm. Now, his speech is actually much harder and much trickier because it's full of images and metaphors like tossing on the ocean, portly sail... A simile like uh, seniors and rich burghers on the flood and <clears throat> pageants of the sea and curtsy to them, a metaphor as they fly by them with their woven wings. Now, clearly, his text is heightened and lifted above naturalism. He's coining phrases, he's finding unusual words. But first, let's ask ourselves our basic question, what's his intention? Well, I th think his intention uh, is to cheer cheer him up, um, um, probably by sending him up, or cheer teasing him up. Him up teasing. Him up. Yeah. Good. Well, having established the intention at the start, now what do we do about the language to further that intention? Uh, language which you would call heightened language. Yes. And, and can you define that, heightened language? Yes, I'm taking it a bit for granted, aren't I? I suppose the easiest way would be to say any language which is not naturalistic, any place where there are images and metaphors and similes or rich, surprising language. So let's just keep comparing the two speeches, and I think the difference is pretty obvious. Let's see what happens, for instance, if we try to do poor old Solerio's speech naturalistically. Just see what happens. Well, completely flat, straight, natural. Yes. As I would speak, or anybody would speak, just... Just try and see what happens. Well, your, your mind is uh, tossing on uh, the ocean. <laughs> uh, there where your Argus is with uh, portly sail, like uh, signors and uh, oh, rich burghers on uh, <laughs> flood, uh, well, as it were, they... I think that's well, the Well, the pageants of the sea, yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> well, it doesn't work, does it? It's unclear and it's woolly. You can't deal with a heightened speech like that. It's just not the way it's written. It must be something that the actor, or rather the character he's playing, finds for himself because he needs those words and images to express his intentions. You need those words to, as we've agreed, cheer up and send up Antonio. So you've got to find them, or we can call it coin them, or fresh mint them, or any word that we want to invent the word at the very moment that you utter it. You need it desperately. It's not just a word that pre-exists in the text. It's got to become your words. What the director usually asks the, the actor to do to deal with a particularly heightened piece of language is to, is to put it into inverted commas, right? Yeah. But um, surely the danger with that is that it sounds as if the actor is always being very self-conscious about what he's saying. And the trick of it is, I think, is for the character to put it into inverted commas so that he's admitting to us, the audience, that what the language he's using is not common parlance, it's not usual speech. And we see him taking pleasure in in choosing his words, picking his yeah. own words. Or we could say, clarify your intention as to why you're making the speech, and then decide why you use those particular words in order to pursue that intention. That's right. In fact, the actor needs to do all that. So let's take the speech again, choosing and coining the words with the intention of cheering him up and sending him up as we've agreed. Should I just say, and such a want wit sadness makes of me, that I have much ado to know myself. Oh, your mind is tossing on the ocean. There, where your Argus is, with portly sail, like signors and rich burghers on the flood. Oh, well, as it were, the pageants of the sea do overpeer the petty traffickers that curtsy to them, do them reverence, as they fly by them with their woven wings. Well, that was wonderful because you had a lovely balance between the heightened elements and the naturalistic elements, and that balance is something that we're always looking for and we'll keep coming back to. And it's a great deal clearer, too, isn't it? And it sounds as natural, I would say, as anything that we like to call naturalistic in the theatre. John, there's always uh, a debate 
that rages in me whenever I find myself with a new text in a rehearsal room. It's the debate between uh, naturalism and, and realism. And I think that there is a distinction. I think that more and more I find naturalistic acting, that is, totally reported nature, inappropriate mm. when finally I'm on stage. Because one is um, in an environment that is, that is nature highly organized, and therefore naturalistic acting is not, um, is not appropriate. Uh, it, it, it's a false exercise. Also, to the Elizabethan mind, let's not forget that to be against nature or to be not natural was something profoundly disturbing. And, and to hold the mirror up to nature or to overstep not the modesty of nature were, were maxims to the actor to perhaps just say, root yourself in nature, but then once rooted in nature, remember that your landscape as an actor, the play is compressed, organized, a uh, condensed version of the truth um, where time itself enjoys a false perspective. I mean, Lear's whole destiny unfolds in the space of an evening. That is not naturalistic, but he must be rooted in nature for the emotions to be real and contagious. Yes, really the word naturalistic is just the name for a style. It doesn't actually really mean natural in the real no, sense. No, it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous yes. word, but I think what, if we know what we mean by it, then we're on much safer ground. That's right. And I go back to our point about there has to be a balance between being seemingly natural and getting in terms of the heightened language. Now, we've seen what happens if we do the speech totally naturalistically, and we've seen David do it with a beautiful balance. Let's now be very unfair and see what happens if we go to the other extreme of losing the naturalness and overplaying the heightened language, because that's the other trap that we have to avoid. Ham it up a bit. Ham it up <laughs> a bit. That's very ham, that. Isn't it? It's good. It's, 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 a, it's a good start, yeah? It's a very good start. <laughs> <laughs> it's always been my problem. Your mind is... <laughs> Tossing on the ocean. There where your Argus is with portly sail. Like signors or rich burghers on the flood. Or as it were, the pageants of the sea. Do overpeer the petty traffickers that curtsy to them, do them reverence as they fly by them with their woven wings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, there's a, there's a, <laughs> you see why we say balance. <laughs> yeah, but there's a danger in all this, isn't there? Because it's so easy to laugh at that, and we're all so keen to avoid it, that we get into lunacies um, try, trying to, to prove that things are modern and, and doing things to try and take the curse off heightened language. Uh, for instance, um, people peppering a bit of heightened language with little, almost subliminal modern tags. Um, for instance, um, a line like, um, the barge she sat in, like a burnished throne, burned on the water, can all too easily become. Uh, well, the barge she sat in, like, like a sort of burnished throne, <laughs> you know, burned on the water. And you can do that without even being aware you're doing it. Right. Well, it's got some sympathy with the actor's instinct to do that. It's just that it distorts as much as Ham does. Obviously, the actor has to find a key point, and we can say it and must say it over and over, a balance between those two extremes. So we've really reached a golden rule. The actor has to marry the two traditions of heightened language and naturalistic acting. I must confess, uh, I find it very difficult to draw the, a clear division between what you've called two traditions. Mm. I, I, I'm sure you're fighting to define a problem, but uh, to me, it's probably more a problem between good acting and bad acting. Good. Um, yeah. the, any play that an actor does, as Ben has suggested, uh, is to 
uh, is going to be concerned with an organised view, the playwright's view, of, of, of the world and of uh, the inner world of, of ourselves. And every speech we have, whether it's uh, in a soap opera or by Shakespeare, is not going to be like speech in real life. So there's always the problem of uh, what is the style of the writing. Uh, and the style of acting with, against which modern actors of whatever generation they come rebel it is not the style of the writing, but the style of the actors of a previous generation. And I suspect that actors uh, from Richard Burbage, the man who first acted Shakespeare's heroes, right through to uh, us today, have all been concerned with truth and reality and nature. It's just that we've had different perceptions of them. And that our naturalism of today is reacting against the naturalism of, say, the 19th century, where indeed the, the gesture was large, partly because the theatres were large, partly because in 19th century England, uh, everything about the world seemed to be certain. The British Empire was there and was going to last for a thousand years, and therefore Henry Irving could stand firmly on a stage with 3,000 people and make declarations. And that was the nature uh, of life which uh, he could find within Shakespeare. We with our different perceptions of the world, uh, the fact that life is difficult, ambiguous, complicated, the British Empire doesn't exist anymore, and what is our role as a nation in the world, what is our role as people, as parents, as children, tends uh, to direct our attention into the detail. That's right. Well, of course I've been oversimpling, and of course it's simplifying things, but what always happens when we talk about acting is that one presents a sort of label to talk about it, like I've said, the two traditions. And as soon as one says it and defines it, we have to qualify it, because actually we're oversimplifying. There's naturalistic text in lots of Elizabethan plays, and of course there is heightened language in modern plays. But I still think that my general point is true, that actors are normally much more at home with a naturalistic text, because that's what they work on the most today. If they can make this marriage of the two traditions harmonious and get the balance right, there's no question of the result being either too naturalistic or too this or too that. It'll work, it'll be real, and we'll accept it. John, we've been talking about finding a balance between nature and poetry, of, um, of bringing the two elements together, but often Shakespeare achieves a dramatic effect by deliberately switching from the one element to the other. Oh, absolutely. He does so in our example from The Merchant of Venice. Now let's look at an extreme example and switch to another play for a moment. In Othello, there's a wonderful switch of naturalistic language following heightened language. Here is Othello when Iago has just been convincing him that his wife is unfaithful. I had been happy if the general camp Pioneers and all had tasted her sweet body, so I had nothing known. Oh, now, forever, farewell, the tranquil mind. Farewell, content. Farewell, the plumed troops and the big wars that make ambition virtue. Oh, farewell. Farewell, the name steed and the shrill trump the spirit-stirring drum, the piercing fife, the royal banner, and all quality, pride, pomp, and circumstance of glorious war. Farewell, Othello's occupations, gone. Is it possible, my lord? It's pretty telling, isn't it? Single, short verse line. Is possible, my lord, after all the colour and the richness that's gone before. Contrast, ringing the changes. Shakespeare does this over and over. It's true that a heightened speech may lift the emotional pressure of a scene, but it's also true that it may pave the way for something quite down to earth and very simple, which is even more telling. The one style helps define and set off the other. Now, let's go back to the merchant and look at it just a little bit further when another character, Solania, Ben, come and do Solania, when he joins in. But this time, let's take the scene as if it's the middle of a conversation that's been going on a long time. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. It wearies me. You say it wearies you. Mm. But how I caught it, found it, or came by it, what stuff it is made of, whereof it is born, I am to learn. 
And such a want wit sadness makes of me that I have much ado to know myself. Your mind is tossing on the ocean. There, where your Argus is with portly sail, like seigneurs and rich burghers on the flood, or as it were, the pageants of the sea, do overpeer the petty traffickers that curtsy to them, do them reverence, as they fly by them with their woven wings. Believe me, sir, had I such venture forth, the better part of my affections would be still with my hopes abroad. I should be still plucking the grass to know where sits the wind, peering in maps for ports and piers and roads, and every object that might make me fear misfortune to my ventures out of doubt would make me sad. I know Antonio is sad to think upon his merchandise. Believe me, no. Hmm. I thank my fortune for it. My ventures are not in one but bottom trusted, nor to one place, nor is my whole estate upon the fortune of this present year. Therefore, my merchandise makes me not sad. Why, then, you are in love. Fie. <laughs> Fie. Not in love, neither. <laughs> then let us say you are sad because you are not merry, and where it's easy for you to laugh and leap. And say you are merry because you are not sad. <laughs> uh, very good, very lively mixture of being both heightened but very real. Good. It, 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 it does help, doesn't it? When it suddenly, I've done the scene with, with Ian on my own, working on the heightened language, working on all that. Suddenly, the introduction of your character draws out your uh, contribution. Yes, and, and I'm able to have fun. Uh, with Antonio off you. And the audience learns about Antonio very quickly by what we tell them about him. You yeah. are not normally like this, That's right. is what we're saying. Yeah. You are not yourself. Come on, come on, come on, you're not yourself. And when do you think where it appears in the play, uh, this is wonderful yes, way of exposition? Yes, marvellous, marvellous. So mm -hmm. I notice you've been basically using one word to describe Salerio's richer language. That's heightened. Mm. You haven't used the dread word poetic. Uh -huh. Poetic, dread word indeed. A very dangerous word because it's so general and imprecise. If you say to an actor, do it poetically, I reckon that alarm bells ring in his head. Well, it certainly it? frightens me to death, yes. Don't you yeah. think it just takes care of itself? I mean, if we, if we use all the, the things that we've been talking about, the yeah. language itself will... Uh, and our own spirit, I suppose, will express the poetry. We don't That's have to think right. About if it. you try to be poetic, it leads to what I've called playing the quality or the mood mm. and putting a great big wash of lyricism or sentimentality over the speech. And above all, it can lead, as we say, to generalising. Well, I've deliberately started the programme with a rather humdrum, simple example because I want to look at what goes on in the norm of Shakespeare. In our later programmes, richer and stronger examples will follow. For now, I just want to establish our main point, that playing Shakespeare is to do with marrying the two traditions. And I'm certainly not suggesting that one's more important than the other. They're both vital. But it makes sense to start with our own tradition because that's what's inside us and that's what we know best. Yes, that's the heart of it, I think something that we have to trust because it's there inside us and it's why i put the elizabethan tradition second so i repeat marrying the two traditions is an idea that we'll keep on coming back to <laughs> 